Let's ask God to speak to each and every one of us in this place today. Would you join me? Let's just pray real quickly. Father, we thank you for your word. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today. Lord, we don't come for tradition. We come to hear from you and you alone. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through your word, your will, your desire for us. And we give you the praise and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen. amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want to take you to where I believe God impressed upon my heart. John, the third chapter. John, the third chapter is a very famous ver or a very famous chapter in the Bible. Almost everybody who's ever read the Bible at any given point in time has come across John chapter 3, verse number 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And John chapter 3 is really the discourse or the, the, the narrative of a story between a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus who comes to Jesus with some questions and with some thoughts. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, truly we believe that you are from God because nobody can do the things that you do if you're not sent from God. And Jesus replies right back to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And it begins this discourse of confusion to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, what does that mean? What are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus says, Nicodemus, what is the thing, what is born of the flesh is flesh is physical. That which is born of the spirit is of the spirit is, is the unseen. And he says, I'm not speaking of your physical rebirth, but rather a spiritual rebirth to be created new in the eyes and the image of God in your spirit and in your soul. And he talks about being born again. You've heard probably us talk about that here at the church. We believe wholly in that. And so in that conversation, Jesus begins to talk to Nicodemus. And then Jesus says these words. He says that God sent his son down. The son of man is what he referred to himself as. He sent him from heaven down to earth. And then Jesus says this in this conversation, a very peculiar statement that Jesus was talking to, in, uh, to this religious leader about. And he says in verse number 14, he says, Just like Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted. I thought, wow, what an, what an interesting statement that is. And he goes on in verse number 15, he says that whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. It's kind of this out of left field type statement in the middle of this conversation. It's like, whoa, Jesus, what are you talking about? You just, we're talking about one thing and then you're talking about a story of old. And Jesus was referring to a story of the exodus of Egypt. And you can find this story in Numbers, the 21st chapter. And if you're not familiar with it, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been living in Egypt for, for many years, centuries really. And their population had grown and Egypt had eventually enslaved them and uh, brought them to slavery to do their work for them. And there was a man by the name of Moses who was led by God to deliver the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We call them Hebrews. And the Hebrews were uh, on their way out of Egypt. Maybe you saw that movie Ten Commandments or you saw the Prince of Egypt or something like that, that cartoon, and you might know some of the stories. And there they miraculously left Egypt after the ten plagues and they went through the Red Sea and they were led by Moses who was led by God. And Moses brought them to the borders of what we would call the Promised Land in the Bible. And the Promised Land to us is modern day Israel. It was the land in which God had promised Abraham centuries before. Now it was their season to come into this promise of God, but they weren't ready yet. They weren't prepared yet. And they, they, they failed the test that God had put them through. And so God said, I'm going to send you to the wilderness to wander for 40 years until the generation that is being raised up now is ready and prepared. And he, and he encouraged them and he equipped them for 40 years. He trained them through their hearts, through the, the, the experiences that they went to, to be the people who he had desired and designed them to be. And so it's in this period of wilderness wandering that the people began to speak poorly of Moses and they began to speak poorly of God. And in this, because of their grumblings and because of their complainings, God's wrath came upon them and there, there were snakes that came from the wilderness into their camps. Now, if you're like me at all, I hate snakes. I don't care if it's a good snake. I don't care if it eats rodents. If I see a snake, you will hear me scream like a little girl and one of two things will happen right after that. I will run as fast as I can or I will jump as high as I possibly can. It's just a natural reaction. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so snakes come into the camp 
and they're biting the people. And these are poisonous snakes. And so the people are getting bit by these poisonous serpents and they're dying. Lots of people are dying. I mean, talk about a miserable judgment. So the people of God, they cry out to God and they say, God, forgive us. We've sinned. We recognize that. We acknowledge that. And God goes to Moses and Moses cries out to God, God, forgive your people. And God says, I've got a plan. I've got a solution for you. And so God instructs Moses to take a serpent and build a bronze serpent, an image of a snake. And he says, put it on a pole and take that pole out to the middle of the camp of everybody and put that pole way high up in the air so that way anybody who is ever bitten by one of these deadly snakes, if they would just look upon this bronze snake in the wilderness, elevated to a high position, they would be healed and they wouldn't die. It's a real peculiar story because they're, they're praying for salvation. They're praying for redemption. If it was God that brought the snakes, why didn't God just recall the snakes? Like, hey, come on. All right, you did your job. Let's go. But rather, he had them fashion this snake and elevate it high. And so now Jesus, thousands of years later, comes back and says to Nicodemus, just like Moses lifted up that snake, that bronze image of a snake in the wilderness, he said, so must the Son of Man. And the Son of Man was what Jesus referred to himself as. So must the Son of Man, so must I be lifted up, be elevated, be exalted. And he goes on, he says, whoever would believe would have everlasting life. You see, looking back at this kind of odd story in the Bible is the, the serpent was a type. It was a foreshadow of Jesus. We look back at this and this was the imagery of salvation. If we would just look upon, we would be saved. If we would just believe in, we would, we would be saved and find salvation. And so Jesus is giving the imagery of salvation. And I believe what Jesus is saying is he's saying to Nicodemus, the very essence of the creation of humanity is this. If I would be lifted high, Jesus says. See, I believe the purpose for each and every one of us here on earth, all the way back from Genesis when God said to, about Adam, let us make man in our image. And he fashioned man out of the dust and he did what he did to no other creature on earth. He breathed his breath of life into humanity. He created humanity for a reason, for a purpose of existence. And now Jesus, I believe, is telling Nicodemus that I have come, that humanity could fulfill their existence here on earth with a reason. And our reason, our purpose, our existence here on earth is to elevate Jesus in our lives so that we might elevate Jesus through our lives. You see, the whole purpose that we exist on earth is to exalt, to bring high, to elevate Jesus Christ in our lives to a position in which he is designated to be in our lives. And so Jesus is simply telling Nicodemus the purpose of humanity. But the thing I see and the thing I noticed as I was reading this, when Jesus said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, like that serpent, the imagery is the serpent was held high upon a stick where people could see it, is that there are so many things in this world in which we live. There are so many things that come at us from every direction that present itself as a solution to the problems of our lives, as the answer to our desires, as, as a sense of hope that if we would just grab a hold of, if we would just adopt, or if we would just adapt, or if we would just grab a hold of, or if we would buy or purchase, or, or, or dress this way, or own this thing, or, or, or follow this trend, that we would find fulfillment, fulfillment and purpose in our lives. I mean, anytime you turn on the television and you see a commercial, Somebody is selling you a solution to a problem. And they, they, they spend billions of dollars every year convincing you they have an answer. I was just thinking about this this last week. I was cleaning the windows in my house. It's a very rare occasion that I do that. But I was cleaning the windows in my house and I was looking at the Windex bottle that I was holding. And I thought it was really amazing. I studied marketing in college and I thought it was really amazing. On the Windex bottle, we're talking about window cleaner, right? It said, new and improved limited time only formula. Like, if you don't get this Windex right now, your windows will never be as clean as they possibly can right now. You better go to the store. 
Get that Windex because it's limited. <laughs> See, but everything comes at us with a solution, with an answer, with, the, with, with something that we don't have that we need. When you look at social media, when you look at society, when you look at culture, there's always something that if we could just get a hold of that, if we could just get a hold of this, if we could just be like that, if we could just be like this, then our lives would be better and our lives would be fulfilled. And the problem is, is that as things, so many things come at us from so many different directions, everything becomes eye level with us. And Jesus goes from being the only hope of humanity to just another source of hope to humanity. That your hope might be in that diet or that doctor or that prognosis or that plan or that product, but rather than our hope is in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. And what happens in our lives is because so many things bombard us as solutions, Jesus remains at eye level with all of the different things on earth that present themselves to be answers to our problems. Sure, on paper, every one of us would probably say, yeah, I want to exalt Jesus. I want to elevate Jesus. Oh man, Jesus is the most important thing in my life. We would all probably agree in some form or fashion. But when you look at practice versus theory, so often we say, and in theory Jesus is, but when we take an honest look at our lives, I'm sure that each and every one of us, myself included, can find areas of our lives in which Jesus is nothing but eye level to all the other solutions on earth. I think about it like this. A couple of, a couple of days ago, I went with my family to, uh, to SeaWorld. I, I'm not a real big fan of amusement parks. I just don't like being crowded into, into, in, into, into lines, into crowded, and especially SeaWorld, because I just, I love the place. It's cool. It's great. It's wonderful. It's entertaining. I just don't like big crowds. And every time I've ever been to SeaWorld, it's always been hot and it's always been crowded. And I haven't been probably for a decade or so. And my wife, she's been going. She bought that, that year-long pass or whatever. She says, babe, you got to go. It's Christmas break. Tomorrow it's supposed to rain. It's going to be cool. It's going to be cloudy. It's going to be overcast. Nobody's going to be there because they're all going somewhere else. And so I'm like, all right, you, you got me. I'm going to go. So sure enough, I show up to SeaWorld. And what is it? It's like 95 degrees. And every person in California is at SeaWorld. I'm like, babe, you're not selling me on this place. And we went and saw this show, you know, where the big black fish jumps out of the water and everybody's like, ooh, fish jumped out of water. It's wow, it's amazing. Whatever. And as we were coming out of the stadium that was filled to capacity, I had to go get the stroller that the, ki that the kids were in. And my wife, she was with her mother-in-law who just had surgery. So she was in a wheelchair with her little brother and, and, and my sister Kim and her kids. They were all over on the side. So I walked over to where the strollers were parked. And I grabbed the stroller and I looked across the crowd. And I caught a glimpse of Stacy into where I needed to go. So I grabbed that stroller and I started walking over to Stacy to where I saw her, uh, saw where she was. And when I got to where Stacy was at, she wasn't there anymore. And I was looking around, I was trying to find her, but everything was at eye level, and I couldn't see her through the crowd. So what did I do? I went over to the side of the, of the walkway, and I got up on a stool. I got up on a bench, and there, with the elevation gain that I had, I could clearly spot my wife in the crowd, and she could clearly see me through the midst of the crowd. And I believe that's God's designated position in our life is there are so many things that come at us eye level that if we don't make Jesus above eye level, that we will miss out on God's designated purpose for our life. You see, if our reason for existence is to elevate Jesus in our lives so that we might elevate Jesus through our lives, I believe that if we don't elevate Jesus in our lives, we will be ineffective at elevating him through our lives. And that's why the followers of Jesus are oftentimes branded hypocrites and bigots and religious zealots and thus and thus. Because we miss out on the purpose in which we exist. There was a rich young ruler or a lawyer that came to Jesus and kind of tried to ask him a trick question in Matthew. I think it's the 23rd chapter. And he said, what's the greatest of all of the commandments in, in your word, in God's word? And Jesus says, well, that's an easy question. I was paraphrasing. That's easy. He says, the greatest of all commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. 
But then I love this. He adds a comma to his thought. And he says, and the second, I didn't ask what the second was, but Jesus says, they go hand in hand. It's not an exclamation point. It's a comma. He says, and the second is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. You see, we all want to live meaningful lives here on earth. Life is short. There's only so much time that we have. And if life becomes all about business, becomes all about building an empire, about gathering vacation hours and, and, and good experiences and great memories and, and, and all the different things and the nice cars and the nice house and the nice clothes and then all the friends, then we miss out on the very purpose, the very essence of why we were created and put on this earth. What are we here for? To elevate God in our lives, that we might elevate God through our lives. Because at the end of your life, that business empire will pass to somebody else. At the end of your life, that car, that house, those clothes, those possessions will be destroyed by moth and by rust and by decay. Someday, California might even get the big one and wash into the sea like all of America thinks. And then where's that house and that car and all that? And in Jesus' name, we believe no. But you see, our purpose in life is to elevate Jesus in us, that we might elevate Jesus through us, that people would see us and not see all the things that we have, all the things that we've done, all the memories and experiences that we've had, the, the great vacations and the possessions and the families and the friends, but they would see Jesus in us because we've elevated Jesus above eye level in our life. So that in a way, no matter where we are, like Jesus said to that pole, no matter where they were in the camp, they could see that serpent high and lifted up. That is exactly what God wants for us is to put that position of Jesus above eye level that we might look no matter where we are in life so that we don't have to ask, God, I don't understand. God, I don't understand why it's going like this. Why, why am I not getting the answer? Why are things not working out? Why is everything a big hot mess in my life? And God just says, if you just elevate Jesus in your life, you would clearly see the hope of humanity, the hope of your life, the answer, the only answer to your life. Everything else is waste and not. So as we think about 2017, and as you examine your life, and I hope you will, and as you try to set those resolutions to, to diet, or to cut back on TV, or to read, or to, to, to pick up a new hobby, or to, 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 to learn a new skill, or to do something to spend time more with loved ones, I, I hope you do that. I hope that you would be serious about that. And I, and I hope you would follow through with that through the course of this year. But as you look at your life, and as you examine what is it in my life that I want to improve on, I want to challenge you, would you make the greatest resolution you possibly could make on this January 1st of 2017? And would you ask yourself the question, what can I do to elevate Jesus in my life? What can I do to elevate Jesus in my life? I believe if you'd be honest, I believe that if, you, if you'd really look at your life, you say, you know what? There's areas, Pastor Luke, where Jesus is high and lifted up on my life. But if you'd look at your life, I, I bet you'd find certain areas, certain places in which Jesus is only eye level. I know in my own life, there are areas in which God is speaking to my heart to say, you need to lift Jesus higher in this area. And you need to lift Jesus higher in this area of your life and trust in me more than everything else around you. And, and I'm not going to give you four or five different good ideas on how to lift Jesus in your life. I think those are great ideas and oftentimes are very, very helpful, but not always the how-tos work. I remember I read a book last year called, uh, If How-Tos Worked, We'd All Be Skinny, Beautiful, and Rich. So I'm not going to tell you how to elevate Jesus in your life. Why? Because based on your own experiences, based on your own season, based on your own position right now, I believe if you'd ask God, he'd tell you the areas of your life. But maybe it starts with something simple. Maybe it starts with just picking up your Bible and actually reading it this year. Wow. Who'd have thought? Maybe it starts by attending church 
on a more regular basis and listening to what God wants to do in your life. Maybe, maybe it starts by turning off the pop music and your radio on the way to work or the country music and putting on a praise CD or a worship CD and just spending some time on the road and say, God, here I am. Speak to me while I'm captivated in this car. Tell me what you want in my life. Tell me what I can do in my life. Maybe, maybe it's joining a servant group here at the church and getting involved in a ministry, doing something for the kingdom of God. What I do know is this. There's promises in God's word. One in Jeremiah, one in James. Jeremiah tells the people of God, if you would search for God with all of your heart, you'll find him. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, if you would draw near to God, he'll meet you where you're at. He'll, he'll draw near to you. If you were to take an honest, introspective look at your life and ask yourself the question, what can I do to elevate Jesus in my life? I believe with all of my heart. God will speak to you. Why? Because he wants you to fulfill the reason and the purpose you are here on earth to fulfill, to elevate Jesus in your life, that you might elevate him through your life. Paul paints this interesting perspective in Philippians in the second chapter. Verse number nine, Paul's writing to this church at Philippi in this letter, and Paul says that God has highly exalted Jesus and given him the name above every other name. The name at which every knee should bow. Every knee on earth, every knee in heaven, and every knee under the earth. That means every knee in every realm, physical and spiritual, will bow to the name of Jesus. You know what's so cool is we look at that verse and we say, man, praise God, there's going to be a day when Jesus has his victory and everybody's going to acknowledge and declare that Jesus is the Son of God. That day is going to come. Let me tell you something. I believe that day has come. I believe we're living in this day right now. You see, this is God's designated position for his Son, Jesus Christ. I think of it like this. Back in the day when I was in high school, I played hockey. I remember we'd play hockey and we'd have our practices. And at the end of the practice, the coach would call all of us skaters over, all of us players over. And he'd say, hey, everybody gather around. And we'd all go out on the rink and he'd say, take a knee. And what did we do? We'd all get down on our knee. And he'd come out into the middle of that crowd. And in the middle of that team, all 24 of us or so, he'd start talking to us. You guys need to skate harder. You guys need to push. Defense, you need to pick it up over here. And offense, you need to look at where the puck is going and not where it is and all these different things. And he would do what coaches did. But what I thought about that is every time he would tell us and he would talk to us, he would say, take a knee. And every time we took a knee, what we were doing is we were decreasing our elevation so that his elevation was increased and that our focus and our attention was fixated upon what he had to say and not how we were feeling at the very moment. I believe Paul is talking about the very position the world must take. The reason for our existence is that we must take a position and to decrease our elevation so that Jesus' elevation would increase in our life and that he would no longer be seen at eye level with every other solution in life, but rather we would see clearly the elevation of Jesus, the answer, the bright and morning star, the Son of God, the only hope of humanity would be clear and visible and, and visible to our lives. See, I think what happens is we get it backwards. We want to elevate Jesus through our lives so that we might elevate him in our lives. And we get wrapped up in mission and we get wrapped up in, in, in intention and we get wrapped up in agenda. The world needs to know about Jesus and you got to get out of here and tell somebody about him. And I agree with that wholly. But the thing about our culture, the thing about our society that we've been trained, we've been trained to see right through a sales pitch right through an agenda. And so when we go hoping to elevate God through our lives, but we've not yet elevated him in our lives, we go empty and we go with an agenda and we go with an intention and we go with a mission and people see right through that. But I believe this. If we would just focus on what's important, elevating Jesus in our lives, I believe this with all of my heart and I submit it to you 
that I believe if you would just focus on elevating Jesus in your life, that he would provide for you the opportunities to elevate him through your life. Without agenda, without mission, without intention, people would look at you and they would not see you, but they would see him. Like John the Baptist said, when his ministry was coming to an end and Jesus was just beginning, John said, I must decrease so that he would increase. The only thing I ask for you today is what can you do? Not just this week, not just this month. What can you do this year as a resolution to be resolved and unwavering about to elevate Jesus in your life? that he would provide an opportunity that you might elevate him through your life to others. Would you make that resolution? Would you look and, and be honest with yourself and say, where are the areas in my life that I need to elevate Jesus so that I might elevate him through this area of my life? One of the things that we do here at the church in January, our leadership team and some of the volunteers here, and our ministry servers here, what we do is we like to take some time in January to fast. What is fasting? It's kind of this weird concept in which we forego something, whether it be a meal, whether it be a certain food group for a certain amount of time, a day, a week, the month, whatever it might be. Fast desserts or we fast sodas or coffee or meat or maybe you just want to fast vegetables. And, and <laughs> We take that time and we take that which we're foregoing and leaving and whenever we think about that dessert or whenever we think about that soda, whenever we think about that meal, we take that time to pray, to seek after God and to ask God, God, I'm giving this up for you for this amount of time in my life that you would speak to me, quiet my soul, speak to me. What can I do to elevate Jesus in my life? And I just want to extend the invitation to you this year. Would you join with us in the month of January and maybe fast a lunch or fast for a week, a meal or a food group, or maybe you want to fast social media or television or something like that. You can do that, but just to give up something for a certain amount of time and use the time that you would to do that, to give to God. Say, God, what can I do to elevate you in my life? Because I want to live my purpose. I want to live why I'm created here. I want a life that really means something when I die. And it's not about collecting things. It's not about uh, hoarding things. It's about legacy. It's about building Jesus in my life and through my life. I believe if you do that, he'll meet you right where you're at. In 2017, regardless of what 2016 would be, 2017 will be a year of breakthrough in your life. God's going to do something great if you to elevate him in your life. Will you do it? Will you look and will you ask, what can I do to elevate Jesus in my life? Amen? Amen. Did you guys get something out of that this morning? Well, as we finish today's service and as we wind it down and in just a couple of minutes we'll be done, I want to just take a quick moment. And I want you to just do exactly what we were talking about today. And I want you to take a moment and examine your heart to examine your life. Be introspective. Take, take a thought. Take just a second out of your thought process and look into your life and look into your heart. Where are you with God? Where is Jesus in your life? What does your relationship with God look like? Are you full? Are you fulfilled? Are you operating in an abundance of a relationship or are you operating on empty? Is there something on the inside of you that's craving for more, that's longing for, for yet another thing, and there's an emptiness on the inside of you that you just can't seem to fill, no matter how hard you try? I believe that that's God speaking to you, saying, it's time to fulfill your purpose in my kingdom. It's time to do what I created you to do. Today, I want you to take a look at your life, take a look at your relationship with God. Where are you and where do you stand with God? So often we ask that question just like this. If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a, it's a hard question to ask, but it's a real question. And how you answer that question has a lot to say about your position and your place with God. See, so often we think and we live on assumptions and pretenses that, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'm okay with God. I mean, I haven't done anything bad in my life, so I always just thought that that meant we were good. I want to be good with God. I want to be right with God. 
You know what? I've gone to church and I always thought that people who go to church are good with God. I've never cheated on my taxes and I've, I've given to charitable organizations and I try to do good for humanity and I stand for social justice and human rights and I think that, that, that good people are good with God. I've carried the pastor's Bible and volunteered at church before and I always just thought that that meant that I was good with God. I was raised as a Baptist or a Lutheran or I went to Sunday school or catechism classes. My parents had me baptized as a baby. I always just thought that meant I was good with God. But did you know that nowhere in God's word does it say that because you think, because you hope, because you want, nowhere does it say that because you've given yourself a title or a label, nowhere does it say that because you attend church, nowhere does it say that because you, you've done good things that you stand for human rights, nowhere does it say that because you volunteer or serve in a church, nowhere does it say that because you're a good person that you're going to be right with God and everything's good between you and God. You see, at the fundamental essence of humanity, there's a problem, there's a separation between you and me and God. And that separation is called sin. There's something about humanity that we're born into that we're, we've inherited and we don't even know and understand and realize it. But nobody had to teach you how to lie. Nobody had to teach you how to embellish the truth. Nobody had to teach you how to cheat on that test or steal that cookie when your mama wasn't looking. You figured that out all on your own. And there's a sin nature on the inside of humanity that puts us at odds against God. See, God's word says that God is so righteous that he couldn't even look upon sin. And yet, here we are, a sinful creation. And so there's this chasm, there's this gap, there's this, there's, this, there's this space between humanity and God that no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we work, we can never, never make ourselves good enough to cross it, to jump it, to leap it, to earn it, to deserve it. We're always at odds and at a distance from God. But as we read John, the third chapter, verse 14 and 15, Jesus says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. You see, God did something amazing, unheard of, untold. Nowhere else on earth do we ever see any story like this. God gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on a cross to become our sin, to become our shame, so that if we would give our lives to Jesus, he would bridge the gap of sin and shame and that we would once again be reconnected and reunited to God. That you don't have to live a life of emptiness, live a life of wandering, a life of hopelessness, a life in the dark. Jesus says that he is the light who's come to turn on the light in your life, that you wouldn't walk in the darkness, groping about, hoping you would find an answer eventually. Jesus said, I came that you would have that answer that fulfillment, that reason for existence today. And it comes through a wholehearted relationship with God the Father, the creator of the universe who holds the stars in his hands. He wants an intimate, personal relationship with you. How amazing is that? That God wants to know you. And more than that, God wants you to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. See, it's an all or nothing relationship. It's not about church attendance or a sense of religion or spirituality. Jesus is talking to the book of Revelation and he's speaking to people in the church and he says, I know what you're doing. I know your works. I know you. He says, I'm going to come back and I see you and I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. And it's a shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. Designed to get your attention. To say, wait, wait, what did he just say? What he's saying is that lukewarm Christians, they're not all the way up, they're not all the way down, they're not in, they're not out, occasional church attendance, doing some of their own thing, doing some of God's thing, they're not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God, somewhere in the middle. He says, you're not going to make it. And in that same statement, he says metaphorically, he says, I wish that you would just come and you would buy from me gold refined by me and that you would wear robes that I make. And he, he's not speaking of physical gold and physical robes, he's speaking metaphorically that you would come and find wealth in life through me. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, if you just open that door, I'd come in and I'd dine with you and you'd dine with me and we'd have a relationship, a connection together. See, God doesn't want us wandering, hoping, wishing that our lives would be right. God says, I came and I sent my son, Jesus, that you would have life, Jesus says, and have it more abundantly, not just when you die, but here on earth. Reason for existence that that emptiness and that void that you feel on the inside of you would be filled by only what can fill it, Jesus, the hope of humanity. Today I want to give you the, offer, the offer, opportunity to accept the gift of salvation. 
See, Paul tells us that the gift of God is eternal salvation. Like any gift, you have a choice. You can accept it or you can reject it. My wife, she bought me a Christmas present. I liked it. I looked at it. I thought it was great. And as I was going through it, it wasn't what I wanted. And so I told her I want to take it back and get something else. I rejected that gift. You see, you have a choice in life. You can either accept what Jesus has for you or you could reject it. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He won't force his way or make his way. And it's your free will choice to choose today. Will you follow Jesus? Will you give your heart? Will you give your life to Jesus? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you, would you do this for me? Would you take just a moment? Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? I'm not asking you to do that out of embarrassment or shame or we're hiding. I just believe that if you close your eyes and if you bow your heads, you get a moment of privacy. If you'd shut out all the distractions in your life and for a moment think about you and God, where are you with God? Is Jesus elevated? Is he eye level? Is he even in your life? And today, with your eyes closed and with your head bowed, thinking about your position with God, I want to extend an invitation to you for salvation in Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation. And before we do, I want to invite you to be a part of that prayer. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. I'm going to go like this. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three, and I'll smack my hands together. And if that's you in this place today, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, that's me. I want to be a part of that prayer. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus. I feel like there's just something missing in my life. I feel like I've been searching. I feel like I've been seeking. I feel like I've been trying really hard and I can't seem to make it. And today, I want to pray that prayer of salvation. Would you include me in that prayer? You see, I'm a man. I'll see your hand and I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Jesus said that if you just confess him before many, he'd confess you before his father. If you confess him or if you deny him before men, he said, I deny you before my father. The decision's yours today. If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life. If that's you in just a moment, get ready. You can pop your hand up and I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down and we'll pray that prayer together right afterwards. If you're not sure, don't walk out of here without making sure. That's a gamble on your life eternally that you can't afford to make. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've kind of been playing the church game, going to church, doing your thing, doing some of, you know, some of God's thing and riding the fence a little bit here, a little bit there. Listen, I love you enough, respect you enough to tell you the truth. God didn't send his son Jesus to die that you could ride the fence for him. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. And in return, he gives you an abundant life of fulfillment and purpose and eternal life in heaven. The decision's yours and yours alone. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, if that's you in this place today, as I count to three, you pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Right after that, we'll all stand together and I'm going to invite you up here. I want to shake your hand and I'm going to pray a prayer with you today. Nothing else other than that. But today it starts by saying, I want to be a part of that prayer. Would you include me in that prayer today, Pastor? I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down and we'll go forward together from there. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today if that's you. I see that hand. I see that hand back there. I see you here. I see you up in the front. That's you in this place today. See that hand in the back. I see you right over here, my man. I see you over there in the back. I got you up here in the front. That's you in this place. About eight or nine wise people. Say, so, man, I wonder if I should. Spirit of God's knocking on your heart. I see you right there. Up in the front. I see you over there. Ushers are pointing. I see you. I got you. I see you. Just wondering, is this me? Is God knocking on your heart saying, would you answer? Would you open the door if that's you? Will you respond to God today? About 11 wise people or so. Anybody else in this place today? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for the 11 or so wise people. It's great. Now I said I want to pray a prayer of salvation and I want to pray that with you. I want to look you in the eyes and shake your hand and tell you congratulations. I'm not going to do anything other than that. So would you do this in just a moment? We're all going to stand. My friend Elijah is going to sing a song and as he does... Would you grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, family member, if you came with somebody, look at them and say, come on, would you go with me? Would you get out of your seat and get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come meet me right here at this altar so I could shake your hand and so that I could pray with you today. Let's all stand together. If that's you in this place, come on, let's change destinies together. Let's pray that prayer of salvation together right here, right now, wherever you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. Come on, let's pray that prayer together.
you guys came. You know what? Let me just tell you something. You might have had a life full of mistakes, mess, up, mess ups, and mishaps. But let me be the first person today to tell you, good job. Good job. You're doing a good job. See, so you're making the very best decision you possibly can make to choose life in Jesus. There's nothing better than what you're doing right now. Somebody's got to tell you, you're doing a good job. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer of salvation. Now, you need to understand this. A prayer of salvation is not some abracadabra magical formula like you repeat some words and you said the right formula and everything's good between you and God. God doesn't listen to the words of your mouth. He listens to the words of your heart. So I'm going to give you some words to say and you're going to repeat them after me. We're going to pray together. But don't let them be my words. Make them your words. Paul, the apostle in his book of Romans, he says that if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'd be saved. And that's what we're going to do to get together today. So I'm going to lead you. You repeat these easy words after me, but you make them yours and you believe them in your heart. All right? And I'll tell you what, we're going to take it one step further. We're all going to pray together, all right? So I'm going to ask you all, would you all bow your heads one more time and close your eyes and repeat these words after me today and make them yours. Just repeat these words after me today. Father God, I come to you today and I acknowledge that I need you. I today give my heart, give my life to you. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for my sins, that He rose from the dead, and He's with you in heaven. Today, I make a decision to follow Jesus. I give my heart, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin, forgive me of my past. I dedicate my future to you. From this day forward, I'm headed for heaven, leaving hell behind. I'm a Christian, following Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Just like that. Just like that. Hey, really quickly, here's what I want to do. You see this guy waving at you right over here? His name's Pastor Joel. We just celebrated Christmas. Noel, his name's Joel, all right? He's going to take you just right over there. Nothing weird goes on, I promise. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to pray with you if you need some prayer. He's going to give you a friend to pray with you. He's going to give you some free information to read, to help point you in the right direction on this decision that you've made today. And he's going to invite you to come back. We want to connect you with somebody here at the church that will buy you a cup of coffee, sit down with you for a couple of weeks to teach you some things of the Word of God to get you strong so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything God has for you. So if you just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my friend, Pastor Joel. Can we give the Lord a great big praise in the house today?